My name is Captain Gordon Boyvin. I am the Marine Operations Manager for the University of Southern California Dornsythe and Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies here on Catalina Island. Behind me is the Catalina Hyperbaric Chamber, of which I am a proud volunteer member of her crew. As the Marine Operations Manager, I am responsible for the safe and efficient operations of the Waterfront Department and staff. It includes oversight on the Small Boating Safety Program, as well as the American Academy of Underwater Sciences Scientific Diving Program. Today, I'm going to present a lecture on risk in diving accident management and accident preparedness. The overall theme of this lecture is directed at the lead diver, but it's critical and important for all members of the dive team to understand and apply them. I have been involved with the review and investigation of recreational dive accidents for many, many years. Why do accidents happen? Equipment? Not really. The one common factor in every dive accident is always the human factor. That is what we're going to address today. I hope you learned something that will make you a safer scientific diver. Let's get started. There's never been a diving accident. And when I say accident, I'm normally talking about fatalities, okay? So there's never been one that's been attributed to the failure of equipment. There isn't one where you can actually point at a piece of gear and say, that failure and that piece of equipment caused this problem. Never happened. And in all the years that we've been diving, which has been a very long time, the equipment has improved. It's gotten better, it's gotten more techy, it's gotten more compatible and usable, it's gotten lighter, faster, easier to use. So it's even more so now not a factor. The one thing that hasn't changed, and you would think that if gear was the problem, and now gear has improved, then there still shouldn't be any accidents because gear was never the problem and now gear is better. Gear still isn't, or equipment still is not the issue that causes most accidents. The one thing we can't change and the one thing we can't fix easily is the human that's tied to all the gear. If the human's not smart enough to use <coughs> it properly or to pay attention to what it's doing, the human dies. But I tell people, if you're taking a small boat and you're going to Catalina, it's kind of like flying a Cessna to the moon. You better prepare or be prepared to take care of yourself. It's 19 and a half miles away. It might as well be on the backside of the moon. If you can't help yourself, don't expect someone to come and get you. We move along today because we're going to talk about accident management and how I see accident management and give you kind of a different point of view. And we're going to add some human factors and we're going to add some human factor discussion about it. And I'll leave you with one thought. That every time you dive, for whatever reason, whether you get in the water to go do science, which is why we're here, okay, or you get in the water just because he says you have to have 12 dives a year and you're short two, three, and you know you got a project coming up and you won't be able to dive if you don't go into the cove and get a couple of dives in, so you're coming to do proficiency dives. All right? Every time you put your gear on, every time you get in the water, every time you dive, at the end of a dive, as you're cleaning up and walking away, you need to think about what did I learn? There had to be one thing in that dive, or one thing that made a difference. So let's talk about accident management human in the system. This is the biggest problem we have. You, not you specifically, but you as a human involved in the gear. All right, there are rules for a reason and we use them and we use our skills for a reason. When we don't use them properly, it causes a problem. So I define an accident as a, a specific, identifiable, unexpected, unusual, and unintended external action which occurs in a particular time and place without apparent or deliberate cause. Management in all business and human organization activity is the act of getting to people together to do and accomplish desired goals and objectives. Management comprises of planning, 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 okay? Getting everybody to do what you want them to do, whether they want to do it or not. 
Accident management, my definition, the need to react to an ineffective either preparation of yourself or your equipment, mission or your operational plan, or your performance by yourself or your equipment. So it's a, a need to react, okay? an accident management, a need to react. Management steps, the mission plan. When it works, it works properly. Everything you're going to do as a scientific diver is going to have some form of plan. The rules at the facility, if you want to come and dive, you need to file a dive plan with the diving officer 24 hours prior to your dive. And it has to be approved. Or don't bother coming out because you're not going to go diving. Okay? You want to dive, you need to write up a plan. And the plan's going to say what the maximum depths are, who's diving, what's diving, what equipment you're going to use. Those are things you're going to be taught. All right? When it works, it works properly. You get the data, you get the information, you collect the animals, okay? But when it fails, it normally goes to heck in a handbag rather spectacularly, all right? So you have to have some contingency. An emergency action plan. What are we going to do if, and part of your dive plan is exactly that. What am I going to do if what happens when the emergency action plan fails? Well, remember the emergency action plan has a response to a problem. The problem is probably not going to improve itself. It's probably going to get worse, okay? Recovery response in your role. So we're out diving. Everybody's back on the boat. And someone's not back. What do we do? It's part of what your training is going to cover, okay? Do we get back in the water and look? Can we get back in the water and look? Have they had decompression stuff yet? They're all divers, so you understand decompression sickness. So bottom line is, is can I get back in the water and look without violating decompression problems? So recovery and response, what's your role? What are you supposed to do in that? That's part of your emergency action plan. Six P's of planning. Proper prior planning prevents a poor performance. Some of you have may have seen this before. Some of you may have some dads that have used this phrase for you before. There's probably a key word missing. Yes, there is. It goes right in here. Uh, it makes it to seven Ps. Other than that, proper prior planning prevents a poor performance. Okay? It's critical. You have to think about what's going on. When the plan is done, there needs to be a briefing. The briefing ensures that every member of the group has what we refer to as strong situational awareness. You understand what your specific role is in this activity. Planning components, what you need to think about. The mission, why are we going in the water? You're becoming better skilled divers just by virtue of taking the class, redoing those skills over and over and over again, having the instructors hammer you about fin kick and the body position and trim and buoyancy and breathing and all those things. You're going to be better divers, skillful better divers, stronger divers. And in that, we should be able to say, now take those skills and go use them. Environment, what is the environment, what is the equipment we're using, and what are the people? So the pre-dive briefing has those components in it. So mission, is it fun? Is it work? Is it training? Or is it research? What are we doing? Okay. Um, fun could be construed as uh, training that you're coming out to do proficiency dives, and by that, all we really expect you to do is come back. <laughs> Go on the dive and come back and check in with Eric and say, okay, we're back. And he'll always give you the same response. Great. Jeff, what'd you see? Now be prepared, all right, that when you get out of the water, you better have an answer for that question because you will be asked, what did you see? Or I might say, what did you learn? Yeah, you're coming out to do a proficiency dive tie it into training, but you still have to learn something, okay? 
Is it work? Yeah, we don't use the term work very well in, in, in scientific diving because we're not allowed to work. By that we mean construct or destruct. We're not allowed to build and use tools unless it's a, an approved process, okay? Collecting data, I consider work. Running out transits, that kind of stuff, I consider that work. So when we refer to work, we're actually talking about probably just doing research. We're out to collect data. Your dives are data driven. The reason you're diving is Dave needs eelgrass numbers from a cove. That's the reason you're there. Okay? Environment. What's the visibility? Is there current? Are there tides? Is there wind? What's the depth? Overhead. Both types. Anybody think about two types of overhead environment could be? In my mind, um, um, an overhead environment restricts you from getting back to the ocean, or to the surface of the ocean. You can't go up because there's something above you. All right, so think about it again a little bit. What would be two things that could be restrict you from getting to the surface? Being inside of a cave? Being inside of a wreck? Or decompression. If your computer says, do not go to the surface, do not ascend, you are required to do a safety stop at this point, and it's now a decompression stop, it means you do not have direct access to the surface. So for all intents and purposes, there's a wall above you. You can't go up. So decompression problems or profiling and a physical entity like a cave, or inside of a wreck, okay? Uh, temperature, air and water. You're all going diving this weekend, right? Can I give you a hint? Use a checklist when you pick up your gear. Don't ask silly questions like, do I need a hood? Yes, you need a hood, okay? It's cold. So those are things that we all put into our environment. How do I get there? How do I get out of there? And if I'm there and I'm hurt, how do I get help? Equipment, what are we using? You guys are all using what's referred to as open circuit scuba. Okay, what does open circuit mean? It's gone. We don't capture any of it, we don't reuse any of it. We just, so you have a finite amount of gas you carry on your back, okay? Closed circuit or semi-closed circuit, what would that be? Rebreathers. Okay, means I'm breathing in and out of an, a pair of external lungs that are affixed to me. And between me and those lungs, the gas I'm passing goes through a, a chemical scrubber and removes the bad stuff. And I have a bottle of diluent and or oxygen on board the, the system that has a sensor that says add more oxygen and it either automatically does it or I do it based on what I'm seeing on my computer. Okay, gas mixes. I'm not using air. Is there other things to breathe? Like what? Nitrox. Just call it nitrox. Um, I wrote a paper a long time ago called uh, about nitrox. If, if we're all sitting around a room with Mother Nature, talking to her about going scuba diving, and we said to her, hey, what should we breathe? I can guarantee you she would not say air. Because as a mix, in terms of the proportions of mixes and gas, or of gases that is in normal air, and its physiological response to our body, it really isn't the best thing to be breathing. Breathing something that's normoxic air, it's got the same amount of, of oxygen in it, or nitrox, something that's got a little higher concentration of nitrox or oxygen, and a little less con concentration of nitrogen, all right, is probably for some things better for us. Computers and tables. You're all going to dive on a computer. All your computers are the same. No, there are two types. There are the two types. Uh, but they're all running on the same type of algorithm. And looking at your computer and looking at somebody else's computer, you shouldn't expect to see the same thing, although you may. 
but it shouldn't throw you off if you look at theirs and look at yours and it's different. Okay, your computer is your computer, their computer is their computer. Tools, what tools do we need? Do we need transits? Do we need quadrats? Do we need things to stick in the bottom? Are we putting lines in? What are we doing? Those are all parts of the equipment plan that you need to understand that you've got to get to have this stuff there. There's nothing worse than having all your gear on, getting ready to get in the water, and someone says, have you got the wrench? The wrench. Wrench, wrench. No, they don't have the wrench. All right, well, either walk all the way back up to the shop and get the wrench with your gear on or take your gear off and go back up to the shop or get it, or get back in the boat. Let's take the boat back to the dock Get back up on the dock, go up to the shop, and get the wrench. Those are all things that could have been mitigated with a proper prior plan and a good briefing. All right? The reason the lead diver does a briefing is that everybody gets an opportunity to go, who's got the wrench? Accessories. Because in my mind, half the stuff the dive shop wants to sell me, I really don't need. You know, um, a $29.95 light that shines light underwater is almost as good as the $500 light. It just doesn't shine as bright and as far. But when they flood, they do exactly the same thing. They stop working. And would I rather replace the $29 one or the $500 one? Bottom line is, is what do you need? You know, you have certain required things that you have to have on your body. You need to have a sound making device, a whistle. You need to have a knife should have a snorkel. Okay, those are things that are accessories to your life support gear. Persons. What are the people we're working with? How are they trained? What's their level of fitness? The upside to being an AAUS trained diver, having completed a program like you're in here right now, when you leave USC and you go off on your career to do research or you go off on your career to work for someone in a lab, the expectation you can have is that they are trained exactly the same way I am. I shouldn't see people doing unusual things. Training. So always fall back on your training. All right, You're going to be trained well. Bottom line is, is that you've got to dive. And there's only one way to become a better diver. You know how that is? Get in the freaking water. Dive. Period. Only one way. Training. The people you are being trained with and the people you're going to meet in your career as you move forward as marine scientists are going to be trained the same way. You may find some oddball idiosyncrasies in the way they do things, but that may be institutional. Like NOAA divers don't necessarily mingle well with fish and game divers. Okay? So bottom line is it's normally a, a, an institutional thing that will cause you to have little differences. Fitness. You can't be old and fat and dive and feel good about it. Experience. You need to be up front in your plan when you're thinking about doing an operation to ensure that people know that, well, that's why I asked everybody, how many dives have you got? It's not inappropriate to say to somebody who's brand new, they've showed up, they've got their letter of reciprocity in their hand, they've presented it to Eric, boom, Eric approves it, puts them on your dive plan. Bang, there you are, you got a body. Yeah, but can I use them? Well, training shouldn't be an issue. They're not all fat and gooey. I wonder what kind of experience they have. Have you ever dove here before? I'm from Florida. Okay, let me ask the question again. Have you ever dove here before? No. Have you ever had a seven mil wetsuit on? No. Hmm. What might you think about doing? Hey, come on, let's go for a dive. I can tell more about you guys and a diver putting their gear together and standing there watching them than I can by asking them any question. <laughs> their confidence level and their attitude. Well, confidence and attitude 
has put a lot of guys in, in wooden boxes. All right? You got to have a certain amount of confidence in yourself, in your abilities to get yourself from point A to point B, in your ability to get yourself to the surface, that kind of stuff. You've got to have a positive attitude that I can get this done, but not a laissez-faire attitude that at whatever end. No, no, no. The, the, the job of work here is to get in the water and collect the data and come back alive to be able to report the data. All right. So, person, you need to consider their training, their fitness, their experience, their competence, and their attitude. What is a team? What is a team? Team is a small number of people with complementary skills, okay, who have a role clarity. They understand what their job is. They're committed to a common purpose. They understand what their job is, whose performance-based goals. They're, they're, they know that they're supposed to get from here to there and back, and when they're there, do something, all right? All mutually accountable. In other words, if you've got five people helping you collect this data, one person can mess up the whole thing for everybody. They're all mutually accountable. You can be held accountable for the failure. A team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other, right? You have gotta know that that person following you along behind you is there for you as well as the data. Got to know it. Right? You have to have confidence as he must have or she must have confidence in you. Situational awareness. What's your situational awareness? Are you aware of what's going on and how it's going to impact? The consequences of losing situational awareness. When we lose the bubble or situational awareness, we increase the potential for human error mishaps. Situational awareness and team performance. Effective team situational awareness depends on a team member's developing accurate expectations for the team's performance by drawing on a common knowledge base. This concept known as maintaining a shared mental model allows team members to act effectively. Anticipate the needs of other team's members predict the needs of other team members and adapt task or to tasks demands effectively. This is something that is more appropriate uh, or directed at a lead diver. A lead diver needs to look at his group, his team, and in his mind or her mind establish whether or not they're being effective on their mission. Predict the needs of other team members adapt the task efficiently or demands efficiently. You need to be aware of what the team is doing. Are we getting the data we expected to get? And why aren't we getting the data that we expect? If we're not getting it because conditions are bad or these people just aren't able to and we need to go back and refresh some skills or do something different, that kind of stuff. To ensure a shared mental model of, situation, of the situation, team members must share their knowledge relative to the task and team goals, their individual tasks, team member roles and responsibilities. Clues to the loss of situational awareness. The loss of situational awareness usually occurs over a relatively long period of time and it'll leave a trail of clues. When we go and look at dive accidents, we can see the dive falling apart. We can see things occurring, that people are making the wrong decisions or responding inappropriately or not responding and see it falling apart. Be alert for the following clues that will warn of a loss or diminished situation awareness. Confusion or gut feeling. If there was ever a time that you look at a dive and you say to yourself, oh, I don't think we should do this. Listen to your gut. I'm not saying that you call a dive because you've got a gut feeling about it. What I'm saying is, did you look at the dive, your gut feeling is, oh man, this looks like, ugh. then you need to address the fact that it looks that way and move on. Use of improper procedures, departure from, reg uh, from regulations, failure to meet planned targets, unresolved discrepancies, 
ambiguity, fixation, or preoccupation. Confusion, disorder within the team, or a gut feeling that things are not right. This clue is one of the most reliable because the body is able to detect stimulus long before we have consciously put it together. Trust your feelings. If your first response to a thing is, hmm, then you know what, you probably want to take a step back and readdress the whole issue. No one is watching or looking for hazards. When I first moved to Southern California, I was invited to dive with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Dive Team up in Paris Lake. And they were doing their hard hat um, uh, certification dives. And by hard hat, I mean the, the big Mark V helmet, the big brass diving helmet. And I was qualified in that helmet. And they're doing something really weird, as far as I'm concerned, in their dive procedure. The diver is being dressed sitting on a bench not near the edge of the water. He's got 25 pound plotting boots, one on each foot, big brace, brass, uh, uh, breastplate that the helmet attaches to. Over top of that is a large weight belt that hangs on suspenders on top of the breastplate. Then they get him up and they walk him to the edge of the boat and they turn him around and he walks down the ladder and he's standing on the ladder with about 150 pounds of stuff tied to him with no helmet on. And the tender goes over and gets the helmet and brings it over. And while he's standing on the ladder, they had him. They put the helmet on him. And I went audibly, <gasps> and there was a sergeant sitting with me, and he said, what? And I went, um, do, you, do you do that all the time? He was their first diver they were deploying. And, and he went, do what? I said, well, if he falls off that ladder, he's done. He's got no lifeline. I'd have been halfway okay with if he had a lifeline tied to him. He had nothing. And the helmet wasn't on his head. He was just a bag of death. And, and he went, wow. And he stood up and stopped the whole thing and said, hey, our guest has got a point to make. No one's watching or looking for hazards. Vessel or diving operations may require more than just driving the bow of the boat or collecting diver data. The proper assignment and the performance of tasks, particularly supervisory and lookout ones, is essential to safe operations. Use of improper procedures. This puts the individual or team in a gray area where no one may be able to predict outcomes with any certainty. The world calls this normalization of deviance. Okay, and deviance in this phrase is not the guy with the long trench coat hiding behind the bush out here, okay? That's a deviant, all right? You continue to do the same thing wrong, or you continue to do the wrong thing the same way. Sooner or later, because you don't react to that, it's normal. I don't do a bubble check. Bubble check? Yeah. Whether you formally stop and have a bubble check in the process of getting in the water, it should be something that it goes through the back of your mind. When I, look at, when I look at a diver going by me, I expect to see bubbles where? Here. Not coming out of their tank back there. Okay, not coming out of a hose over here, there. So when I look at a diver, I look at a variety of things, and that's one of the things I'm looking for. All right? So whether it's part of your checklist and the things you do or it's just part of what you are as a diver when you look at someone, what's normal, what's not normal. That dive team with the guy on the ladder with the helmet, that's the way they've been doing it since they got trained in the pool with that equipment. Four years, they had done something like 125 dives. Departure from regulations in addition to violating procedures, we are operating in an unknown area where the consequences of our actions cannot be predicted with any degree of certainty. The rules are the rules. AUS has established diving depths. We're the only organization in the world, except for CBAS and European certification agencies, that certify to depth. Following regulations, the AAUS has established long time standing rules about depth, that type of stuff. And when he approves dive plans, approving dive plans based on uh, institutional rules, okay?
In addition to violating procedures, we are operating in an unknown area where the consequences of our actions cannot be predicted with any degree of certainty. Unresolved discrepancies. When two or more pieces of information do not agree, we have to continue to search for information until the discrepancy is resolved. Ambiguity. When information we need is confusing or unclear, we must clarify or to fill in the missing pieces before proceeding. If you don't understand what's going on, you do not belong in the water. Period. Okay, you have to be confident in your role as part of that team. Fixation or preoccupation. When somebody fixates on one task or becomes preoccupied with work or personal matters, they lose the ability to detect other important information. Early detection of both fixation and preoccupation is essential to safe vessel operations. The best way to identify these do clues is by knowing the behavior of your team members and being alert to change. Preoccupation with personal matters can often lead to subtle changes in performance. Maintaining awareness. Recognize and make others aware when the team deviates from standard procedures. Monitor the performance of other team members, provide information in advance, and identify potential existing problems. When deviations are noted, effective team members comment in specific assertive terms. Hey, I'm concerned about this so that the lead diver can go back and go, okay, he's concerned, which means he doesn't like it, but I gotta get him to a point where he likes it, no longer concerned. And this is how we're gonna resolve that problem, okay? Monitor the performance of others. As a lead diver, be alert for changes in the performance of other team members caused by work overload, stress, errors, etc. When changes are noted, take action by speaking up, always, Point it out. Provide information. Don't wait to be asked. When you have information critical to team performance, speak up. Identify problems. All team members are tasked to identify problems before the problems affect a mission and make sure the mission accomplishment. Failure to meet planned targets. During each evolution, we set certain goals or targets. Demonstrate your awareness of task performances. Know how your job and those of other team members contribute to the overall mission accomplishment. It may not be necessary to know the technical aspects of the other team members' jobs, but you must be aware of what actions, information, etc., that they need from you to do their jobs effectively. Again, it's kind of directed more at the, at the lead diver aspect, but you need to be aware of what they're doing and are they, are they failing at meeting the target goals because they don't understand them or they just don't have that skill. Communicate a course of action. Effective communications may be the most important factor in achieving and maintaining situational awareness. You have to talk and you have to listen. All right, don't be talked at, okay? It's an interactive process, don't be talked at. To ensure a shared mental model, speak up and verbalize any intended action. I don't understand what it is you're trying to do. I have no idea what it is you're looking for looks like. Do I look under rocks, on rocks, beside, where, what? Okay. Understand that the level of situational awareness achieved is related to the level and quality of communication observed in the team members. You guys need to talk what you're doing. Pre-dive briefing and a post dive even. Demonstrate awareness of mission task. Ensure that your performance reflects an understanding and awareness of the mission or task being performed. Effective team leaders <clears throat> plan ahead and communicate the plan to team members. It ensures that everyone is aware of the plan and builds a shared mental model of the situation. All right, communicate, communicate, communicate. In the dynamic world of scientific diving, operations plan on chain or Change, plan on change and continually assess and reassess the situation to determine if the team is on track to safely and effectively accomplish the mission goal. I can't tell you how many people get on the boat in San Pedro at 6.30 in the morning with these big grandiose plans about doing something and we looked at them and go, did you look at the weather? And they look at you and go, weather? Yeah, that stuff that's going on around us right now, that 
high wind and did you look at that? Do you have any idea whether or not that may or may not impact? Okay, and odds are they don't have to go to the island that day. They can just stay home. And you need to be able to, to, to plan on the fly. Clarify expectations. Understand that clear expectations lead to a shared mental model. Everybody understands what is supposed to happen. The situation ensures high levels of situational awareness by all team members. If they don't all understand what their primary goal is or objective of the dive is, you're going to fail. The two-challenge rule has been used effectively in aviation to detect fixation in a team member. By that they mean, um, Jackson, stop it. Jackson, stop it. And Jackson continues to do it. He gets two. After two, he gets pulled. All right? Because he's fixated. The two challenge rule. They're only allowed two times to be challenged to get them to stop doing what it is they're doing. Barriers to situational awareness. The following are barriers which may reduce our ability um, to understand the situation. Recognize these barriers and talking corrective action is the responsibility of all team members. A perception based on faulty information processing. Overload. Too much information. There are truly some people in the world that can't have too much information. Fatigue or fatigue. Okay. Bottom line is, if you're tired, you are not firing on all cylinders. All right. And diving is one of those activities that you've got to be firing on all cylinders all the time. Diving in and of itself is not very difficult. It's not very physical. You're weightless. You're just moving around in the water. It's actually quite relaxing. Fatigue will kill you. Fatigue will kill you because it will affect your ability to make decisions and it'll affect your ability to get yourself out of that hole. If you can't dig deeper to get more to get out of that hole, you're done. All right, you're done. Perception is our mental picture of reality. The amount and quality of information available limit all pictures of our current operational state. Insufficient information makes it difficult to ensure that our mental picture is always aligned with reality. Our mental picture is affected by past experiences. We act on information based on our knowledge. Expectations. We interpret information in such a way that it affirms the planned action. We may rationalize that the ship is being set by a current that was incorrectly computed, when in reality no one is compensated for bearing errors in the instruments. That's related to driving a boat. Boat's being moved in the current. I think I'm going that way. I'm actually going this way. Let's put it to you underwater. You pick up your pressure gauge, you look at it, and your pressure gauge says you've burned through two thirds of your air. You're down to a thousand pounds, and you've only been in the water, and you haven't even got half of your work done. Well, I'm not getting to get the other half done with one third of my air. So why did that occur? Well, I'm going to make the right decision. Mark my spot, go up, change tanks, come back and finish off. But if you don't sit down and rationalize why that happened, you're going to have exactly the same problem when you get back in the water and start over. Filters. We are provided with information, but we don't use it. We don't pay attention to the information that doesn't match our mental picture. Excessive motivation is a behavior imposes expectations and filters that affect our ability to fully assess the situation and any safety risks. It includes, but is not limited to, got to get the data or collect that fish in an overriding sense of mission importance. Okay, You have to go out. I spent 15 years as an operational search and rescue technician in the Canadian Coast Guard. And when we used to go out of our, of our door to get on our boat, I worked on a shore station on a small motor lifeboat, there was a sign over the door that said, you got to go, you don't have to come back. And that's how a lot of old-time rescue stuff was done. Firemen, everything, all right? You had to go. Don't have to come back. Got to make an effort. Nowadays, 
we use a thing called a GAR model, green, amber, red. It measures and assesses risk. And everybody on the team gets to vote whether or not they think it's a good thing, a bad thing, or a, a not so bad thing, green, amber, or red. And at the end of a risk assessment, you decide, yeah, maybe we shouldn't go today. So the person that's out there in the shipwreck is, well, you know what, don't worry about it. There'll be another shipwreck tomorrow. Okay? So you, 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 ha you don't have to go. There is no data, there is no fish collection out there worth your life or a life of one of your team members. Performing an appropriate risk management or assessment process using an effective decision making and seeking feedback on judgments can reduce the potential for unsafe acts. Applying a GAR model for risk assessment. GAR is green, amber, red. And you'll be taught this if you haven't already in the class. And literally every dive you're going to do from now on, you're going to assess based on a green, amber, red process. Do we all have the right gear? Do we all feel good? Do we all have enough air? Has everybody got what they're supposed to have? Yep, is the boat ready? The boat's fueled? Yeah, yada, yada, that's all good. The conditions are this, conditions are that. Off you go. Complacency. Assuming everything is under control affects vigilance. You can't just assume someone else saw it or assume someone else is making sure it's done. Overload causes distraction, fixation, increased errors, and high stress. Too much information. Don't give them so much information. Back off a little bit. Ask them, what do you think? And you need to react to the same thing. Whoa, 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 too much information. Fatigue affects vigilance. Adjusting work routine, imposing sleep discipline to prevent wake cycles longer than 18 hours. You've never stayed up longer than 18 hours in your life, have you? <laughs> Bottom line is, is the scientific dive team does not need to be up for 18 hours. At some point in time, stop. Everybody go up to the room and take a break. We've had dives, um, research dives on the facility where we've actually had to intervene and say, okay, gang, I'm not 100% sure what your decompression profile is right now, but it's kind of off the scale for us to be able to calculate it. So we'd like you to take 24 hours off. Go have a nice hot shower, go throw an extra blanket on the bed, and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay? It's just the way it is. Fatigue will kill them. Includes forcing lights out, permitting late sleepers. They used to let the late sleepers just, go ahead, go ahead stay in your rack. It'll be all right. We'll catch up with you on the way back. Bye, right? Yeah, that happened a lot. Poor communications. The level of situational awareness achieved is directly related to the level and quality and communications observed in the team. You need to understand everything that's going on that affects you. Human error, the large amount of information processed by teams and the many necessary interactions within and between teams provides the opportunity for human error. Change of human error are normal and should be expected. There are three levels, slips, mistakes, and errors. Slips, just an incorrect action. I said turn right. Okay. Oh, no, no, I meant left. Oh, Jesus. All right, well, that makes a big difference. That's called a slip. That's something that can be corrected. Mistakes are failures in planning. Often have to do with the selection of objectives and the time required to achieve them. Errors are flawed execution. Mistake? Failure in planning. An error, flawed execution. I'd have thought flawed execution would have been the mistake. It's not, okay? Incorrect actions based on either correct or incorrect information. Errors, because they are defined as actions, are the most serious form of human error, all right? Error trapping, what, when to do it and who should do it. Trapping slips and mistakes and errors or breaking an error chain is a key mechanism to avoiding mishaps. Human error can occur at any time. Poor communications. The level of situational awareness achieved is directly related to the level and quality and communications observed in the team. You need to understand everything that's going on that affects you. Human error. The large amount of information processed by teams and the many necessary interactions within and between teams provides 
the opportunity for human error. Change of human error are normal and should be expected. There are three levels, slips, mistakes, and errors. Slips, just an incorrect action. Mistakes are failures in planning, often have to do with the selection of objectives and the time required to achieve them. Errors are flawed execution. Mistake, failure in planning. An error, flawed execution. I'd have thought flawed execution would have been the mistake. It's not, okay? Incorrect actions based on either correct or incorrect information. Errors, because they are defined as actions, are the most serious form of human error. All right? Error trapping. What, when to do it and who should do it. Trapping slips and mistakes and errors or breaking an error chain is a key mechanism to avoiding mishaps. Human error can occur at any time. Uh, the earlier a human error enters the process and or the longer it goes undetected, the less effective the team will be and the greater the potential for mishaps. Regulations are implemented to control some of the known errors and note that regulations and standard operating procedures are not fail-safe mechanisms. So when you look at an accident and we look at a timeline of how things occurred and how things happened and the decisions they made and what they did, what you see is you see an error you see a slip, no one caught it. The guy said turn left five separate times. That's a slip. He didn't correct it. Someone didn't stand back and say, okay, we'll get that bozo out of the way and put a different bozo in charge. Didn't fix it. It went on to be a mistake. Mistake became an error. Something happened bad, okay? So got to step up and be able to fix it. Error trapping, when to do it and who should do it. Team members must be able to identify all levels of human error and be empowered to take corrective action. Defining judgment and judgment change. Judgment is a process that produces a thoughtful, considered decision. In other words, it is the ability to perceive a situation and make a good decision. Good decisions equal good judgment. Poor decisions equal poor judgment. Judgment determines the team actions in a given situation and depends on information that the team members have about themselves, their team, and the environment. In performing the mission, many judgments are made. This series of judgments is called a judgment chain. Are we doing the right things all along? Are we paying attention to conditions? Fewer alternatives seem acceptable as more poor judgments or false information is added to the chain. The seemingly available alternatives for solving the problems narrow. I get myself backed into a corner and I can't fix, I can't see a way out of this corner, okay? Breaking poor judgment chains. A structured approach to decision making is important to prevent a poor judgment chain from either forming or growing. In aviation, they use something called the DECIDE model. If you Google DECIDE model, you'll find that D-E-C-I-D-E, -E, it's detect, evaluate, correct, I, mm, I can't remember I. Um, it's how a pilot resolves issues in the cockpit, okay? Uh, doesn't really pertain to us as much because we're not hurtling along at 300 miles an hour heading towards the earth, um, but it's kind of the same thing. The approach includes a step to evaluate judgments to be effective. The step is three parts. Seed feedback and point out errors from your teammates. What do you think, guys? you think we can do this? You know, I think we need to come back tomorrow. Or go check the tide table and find out when they're slack tied because we're not getting it. Assess stress and level of, within the team. Team is stressed out, not happy. We're not getting the information. Get out of there. Manage resulting risk. For any poor judgment chain to be broken, team leaders and members must recognize that they are human. Well, some of us are human. Be open to the possibility that you can make a poor judgment. Be willing to admit and correct your errors. Seek feedback. To recognize a poor judgment, get feedback. Feedback can come from two sources. Your senses, your gut says, holy crap, we shouldn't be under here. We shouldn't be doing this. We, I, when we're, on the, we're out, we're done, okay? Clues to loss of situation awareness or from an observer. Hey, guys, don't be surprised. You, 
come to the surface one day and we'll be sitting next to you in a, in a skiff going, you're out. Okay? Make the decisions before we do. And if you can, and if you're concerned or you're worried and you think you're not making the right decision, come and ask us. Although the senior team members are expected to use their knowledge and experience to critique their judgments, don't hesitate to get a double check and a second opinion. Communicate, 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 all right? Assess stress level within a team. Too much or too little stress can reduce our ability to exercise good judgment. Access the stress and attempt to obtain an optimal level before continuing. Managing resulting risk. Apply the seven steps of risk management to correct any hazardous situations resulting from poor management. And by the way, if you go, you will find seven steps of risk management. You can just Google that. It's amazing what comes up. Summary. Situational awareness is dynamic. It moves. Hard to maintain and easy to lose. Knowing what is going on all the time is very difficult for any one person, especially during complex, high-stress operations. There may be opportunities when you come out to do a project that we will say to you, tell you what we're going to do. We'll come run the boat for you. So what that does, it eliminates the whole, oh, crap, I don't have to anchor. I don't have to worry about the boat. I can just take that picture that off my plate, okay? It might help. It is important that we know what behavior is effective in keeping us situationally aware. The following actions can help team retain or regain situational awareness. Be alert to deviations from standard procedures. When they start doing things goofy, be alert to that. Watch for changes in the performance of other team members. They're not getting their data. They came back from the, from the dive and they forgot their slate on the bottom. They left the transit behind or the transit's one great big bird's nest. Okay, because they tried to roll it up and couldn't. That's a change in performance. Be proactive. Provide information in advance and identify problems in a timely manner. Show you're aware of what's going on around you. Communicate effectively. Keep abreast of the mission status. In other words, are we getting what we need to get? Did you get it? Did we, yeah, we got, okay, we're doing good. Okay? Continually assess and reassess the situation. Ensure that all expectations are shared for complete awareness by the whole team. An assist versus rescue. An assist is help by a team player. The act of helping. Here, Jackson, let me help you up in the boat. It's assisting him. Help is assist somebody. Advise somebody. Be useful. Make things better. Provide for somebody's needs. Advance something. Keep somebody from doing something bad. And prevent something. Rescue. Remove somebody from danger. Okay? Saving something. A rescue is a response or reaction generated by a failure to plan and to recognize what's going on. My definition, an assist is an appropriate reaction based on an effective recognition of a poor performance. I see that he's having a problem so I intervene and I help him. I assist him out of the situation, all right? Rescue is an appropriate reaction caused by the failure to recognize or failure to assist in a poor performance. It's bad management. I don't recognize that he's having trouble constantly in his dive with this piece of gear. Something's wrong. The fin constantly falls off or doesn't fit or his legs are cramping and he can't use it properly. I don't recognize that. Instead of stepping in and helping him fix the problem and assisting him, I ignore it or I don't recognize it. And what does it cause? Him to need to be rescued. It's not his fault. It's my fault because I didn't recognize it. All right? Root cause analysis. This is the stuff that we look for in an accident. What was the thing that caused this to happen? His pressure gauge leaked. We knew it leaked. Why did he run out of air? Because he had a leak. His inflator was, was self-inflating. Why did he rock it to the surface? Because inflator was self-inflating. And he chose not to how to fix it. And he didn't understand how to disconnect it. Okay? There's a trigger. There's a harmful action. 
there's a disabling injury, which is the cause of death. Overdue, rescue or recovery. The rescue equation is risk versus benefit. This hasn't happened to us yet. When is someone overdue on a dive? What's the definition of being overdue? Anybody? What's overdue? You know why you can't tell me? You don't understand what I'm asking you, right? How can you be overdue for something if you don't know when you're supposed to be? Somebody tells you you're late. Why do you know you're late? Because they told you to be there at 2 and you showed up at 2.15. By definition, you are late. If they didn't tell you when to be there and you showed up at 2.15, how can they tell you you're late? What's overdue? Overdue is, folks, we need to be on the surface with X amount of PSI by X o'clock. Why? Well, because we've got to get back and do other things. But by X o'clock, if you're not back on the surface, you're not back on the boat, what can I assume? Or what will I assume? I'll assume that you're having a problem or had a problem and you're not able to get back to the boat. Sooner or later, you've got to decide someone is overdue. They can only, you can only decide that as a part of your dive plan. When do I want you back? As you guys leave the facility in little boats and go diving and go do your thing, or you jump off the float in the pier and go do your thing, we want to know. We have a general idea where everybody is going and whenever you're going to be back. Okay, because I have to mount a search. And I either do that by calling for helicopters and calling the sheriff and the lifeguards and we go do what we got to do, or, okay, the skiff's not back. Holy crap, the guy's left at 8 o'clock this morning. Oh, we jump in the boat, go around the corner, and there you are paddling back because you didn't check the gas, okay? Rescue equation, risk versus benefit. Am I going to get in the water and look for you? If I can without risking myself, maybe. Now what? In our case, where we are, the equipment, the personal effects, and accident reports are all going to be controlled by Eric. All right? All going to be controlled by Eric. If you're out and away from us, diving, equipment needs to be secured altogether. Personal effects need to be left alone. Accident reports, you need to write everything down. You need to get names of people that are around you on the boat and need to get statements from the witnesses. All right. Odds are really good that if you have a dive accident on a commercial boat, I'm going to be one of the guys that shows up to investigate it. I'll look different because I'll be in uniform. Okay. Um, bottom line is, is we go to equipment, keep it all together, don't disassemble it or change it in any way. We can tell a lot about what happened to the diver by the way their equipment is configured and what we're going to see on that equipment. Ensure that you create a list of anyone who handled the equipment. It actually becomes part of evidence. All right. All diving fatalities in Southern California are um, um, investigated as homicides until proven otherwise. Okay. Unless you can take these actions, don't do anything with the equipment. Note the air contents on the SPG or computer. Mark the tank valve while turning the air off. Count the turns. Do not purge the regulator. Do not remove any accessories or weights from the BC. Package it all together in a large bag. Seal the bag and note the time, date, and persons involved. Personal effects. Gather all the patients' victim personal effects. If they're evacuated by air, we fly them away. Um, send it with the patient if you can. You can't send the equipment. Helicopter doesn't want 200 pounds of equipment on board. If not, collect it all and keep with the dive equipment. Someone will meet you at the dock. Authorities. The United States Coast Guard has the overwhelming authority or jurisdiction over all diving fatalities because they're uh, intertidal or they're all, uh, open oceans and usually off boats. County Sheriff was next. City Police, EMS, and then local dive response team, which normally made up of, uh, of firefighters. In all locales, one or a combination of these authorities will, will have or share jurisdiction. 
They'll be responsible for the equipment and will require it in their custody. Accident reports. If you're involved in an accident, sit down quietly and write everything down. Accident manager, who is, was, might be, or should be the manager in their role. Ensure all components have covered, have been completed. Management skill set, minimum dive qualifications, dive rescue, first aid, CPR, oxygen, and of course their experience. Who should manage the accident? All right. The lead diver that Eric normally assigns. Okay, you'll look at dive pairs. And there's a lead diver in a pair in a dive buddy team. Eric, I've heard him say it a hundred times, I expect you, Jackson, to be the lead diver. There is some expectations with that, and he will explain to you what that is. The briefing, making sure your partner understands things, yada, yada. So we're at the end. We're just living a dream. We only go around once, so work like you don't need the money. <laughs> Love like you've never been hurt. Dance like nobody's watching. Sing like nobody's listening. And live life like it's heaven on earth. And have fun. And remember, every single dive, bring back something that you learn. What was your main takeaway? Now the trick is for you to apply it in your everyday diving operations. Review that point. How can you apply it to your next dive? Remember that you and everyone on your team must be all on the same page and have a clear understanding of the goals of the dive and how to achieve them and what each of their parts plays to achieving that goal. Communications, understanding, and not just hearing the pre-dive briefing and the most critical post-dive briefing. Let us make an effort to recognize those problems which may occur through proper prior planning rather than reacting to a failure. Remember, there is no dive that you cannot learn something from. Thank you for watching and safe diving.